I've seen someone let her jump the line And my heart went and hit rock bottom She hit her face from all the well Like an oyster hides its precious pearl Maybe she'll let me shuck her sometime and see See who? The prettiest girl in rehab She's gone and made me relapse Cause I swore off love the way she swore off cocaine I got a new diagnosis I'm addicted to the damn psychosis Gonna put me through withdrawal all over again Nothing else I'd ever need So she uses far too many words Like so many that it makes my forehead hurt And she thinks she's so much better than me And she's right, the prettiest girl in rehab She's gone and made me relapse Cause I swore off love the way she swore off cocaine I got a new diagnosis I'm addicted to my damn psychosis Gonna put me through withdrawal all over again I said that woman gonna put me through withdrawal all over again Prettiest girl in rehab Hi diddly ho Neighborinos, my name is Jesse Dram, and you're listening to the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast, episode 19. Uh, as you may have just heard, I got around to writing another song today, and I actually record. I, I'm putting this up in like an hour, and I just like crammed to get that song, and I think that's a good one for you know, for uh, I I complete my songs and my podcast the same way I did my homework as a teenager. Just cram it all in at the last second. It'll be fine. Guys, we have a great podcast for you this week. Part 19, pages 531 to 562. We were joined by fellow podcaster Paul Dykeman. Now, Paul reached out to me. He was a listener just like all of y'all. I fucking love this guy. You're going to hear this. Um, I can't say this is my favorite episode. My favorite episode will always be Cousin Frank. However, this is easily the most entertaining episode. Paul has the gift of gab like myself. He's very involved in improv, and we we got into a lot of shit. You're going to like it. You're going to like him. You got to find him uh, on Twitter, at Paul Dykeman. That is P-A-U-L-D-E-I-C-H-M-A-N-N. He hosts The Offer original stories podcast you can find that where all your fine podcast needs are serviced also at the offercast.com and on twitter at offer pod we get into a lot of shit in this we get into uh the believability of addicts specifically randy lentz we get into how podcasting would have taken place in the infinite jest universe which i found very Interesting. I just enjoy all this. We riffed around a lot. We talked about uh, how hard it is to make friends sometimes because there's not a script. I don't know. So go check it out. I hope you guys like the song. That was a fun one. I might uh, I might try to make an actual recording of that at some point because I think on its own, that was actually a pretty catchy song I pulled out of my ass there. Be sure to write in and tell me if I accidentally ripped off any existing song that I'm aware of. That one felt a little too easy. But yeah, so Paul Dykeman. Episode 19, pages 531 to 562. See ya. Episode 19, I Hate Infinite Jest Podcast. Another prime number episode, which has no meaning to anything. I just like pointing it out. (laughs) <laughs> Our guest this week is uh, podcaster Paul Dykeman of the Offer Original Stories podcast. How you doing, Paul? I'm great. I'm just so happy to be, uh, you know, enjoying the world and getting to read wonderful books. Like it's, you know, like I don't, I don't know what else I could want from life, <laughs> really. <laughs> Easy to please, man. Easy to please. Yes. So, 
you and I got right into recording because you and I were talking about how uh, how it seems like everybody like podcasting is the new writing in that pretty much the bar to call yourself a podcaster or a writer is very, very low. And really, there's nothing stopping anybody from calling themselves that, especially considering the very low cash investment to create a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you think too about, I don't know, like the big shift of this is that, you know, uh, 300 years ago to be a writer required a lot of education, a lot of access to methods of distribution, right? And the way this has changed just in the last 20 years, I mean, it was steadily getting more accessible, but the internet has made it possible for anyone to, I mean, first of all, write, like anyone could just distribute a blog, right? But mm -hmm. as everyone now has in what their phone is, a thing that can record video and record sound in a way that they can, and they can instantly distribute it. Mm -hmm. So everyone can suddenly share things that makes them technically a writer, a content producer. And, and this makes the world pretty weird. Um, and it, we're still sort of, I think, learning as a culture how to deal with that because it's, it's, un, it's unusual in the history of humankind that one person could be like, I want everyone to read this thing and they can. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting time. And that doesn't mean that everything's good, but it does oh. change something about the way we consume stuff, I think. See, that's actually what I was going to point out there is that uh, I fit, you, how old are you? Remind me. Sorry, I'm getting something funny happening with my sound. What's happening? Oh, I got you. Can you hear me now? Uh, one second. All right. All right. Uh, I will not edit out any of this. <laughs> yeah, keep it all in. <laughs> all of the, keep all of the mistakes in. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I can get this to, okay. Can I hear? Hey, hey, oh. hey, how you doing? Good. Can you hear me? Can I hear you? I can, yes. I can hear you just fine. You got a great podcast voice, by the way. Oh, thank you. So do you. I really, I really enjoy listening to you. Like I, I, I think it was when I also realized that you were from the Philly area. Like it's just like mm -hmm. comforting to hear your particular sound of voice. Like it's something I'm like, oh, this sounds like somebody I want to sit down with and talk to. So Ray, Randy Lenz <laughs> walked his way home. He walked down the alley to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, Randy Lutz, he's, oh, isn't he, isn't he wild? Anyway, but yes. Right. The, oh, um, so what I was going to say, I asked your age, but really it's not important because it's only how it applies to me. Um, having come up when, uh, I feel like I'm like the very last age group where we didn't just have the internet from jump. Like yeah. we had a computer at like seven and like the internet at like 13. So, but uh, I, I feel like uh, music, the example I'm going to use is film, but it's more applicable to music. Okay. Where somebody pointed out that, uh, like, on a standard smartphone, you have pretty much better editing and filming and camera technology than Orson Welles had on Citizen Kane. So, <laughs> so there's no excuse for us, not, all of us, to be making, you know, genius works of art. The only thing that's happened is in the change of the distribution model, uh, it, it, I feel like it's harder to find anything good. More importantly, it's hard for anything to be, like... Uh, I wonder if this has actually contributed to kind of the balkanization of our country and the world at large, because it's not like there's the four or five things out there and like, oh, well, most people kind of like this. But now it's like you can search for art that scratches like every little particular personal itch with no concern whether anybody else gives a fuck about it, because you don't need other people to bring it to you. All you need is the wherewithal to know where to look and the time to look for it. Yeah, that, and it is, it is really interesting that like for every set of interests, there becomes content for it. Like for every show that you might want to watch, there's also reaction content, like people breaking it down for you, right? Like so there's, there are these rabbit holes of particular fields of interest that are really deep. And I would even say, I mean, with podcasting, it's almost its own, the whole thing is its own niche. There's like, a, there's a whole lot of people who don't even know that it's a way of consuming things as well, right? Which I, is, I, I, I feel like 90% of people over 40 just don't listen to podcasts. And that, like, can you imagine how big this is going to become as a genre of entertainment when like, you know, it's more than just a quarter of the population that even, in, not even isn't aware of it, engages with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it, it could grow really large. But the other thing that's going on right now is that they are trying to make algorithms that are better at reducing that balkanization, right? Like mm -hmm. we're in this weird, because the algorithms are trying to learn like, this is what you want 
or maybe maybe the algorithms engender it. I'm not sure because the algorithms are constantly trying to learn like this is what Jesse wants to listen to, and so I'm going to give him all of these things. Mm. And this can, I mean, I have found recently like I started to feel like, wait, did I watch everything on YouTube? But it was I watched everything it was recommending to me. Mm. Like there was this end of like what the algorithm could give me because it was like it had figured out what I wanted to see and had nothing else to show me. So there's this other wow. thing we're encountering, which is as the computers are trying to learn about us that is uh, like slotting us into our own little isolated niches of like, I'm the only one who cares about all these things, maybe. But there is possibly some way to get out of that with- that's, all- that's, that's pretty, It's pretty impressive, Paul, that you exhausted a supercomputer <laughs> that just wanted to entertain you. And even the supercomputer went, dude, I'm done. <laughs> But it's what I think it reflects is a fundamental understanding of like what the human looks like that computers have like, okay, so they're going to have a list of interests and they only want to see those things, Mm -hmm. which is not exactly true. Like I, and I think it reflects, like I want to encounter things that I'm like, oh, I've never thought about this before. I would love to get pulled in this other direction. Mm -hmm. It's never occurred to me to search this search for this. But you know know who actually has a good take on that is Spotify. They have a, Mm -hmm. a segment they recommend that's literally taste breakers. Yeah. Right. And I think that's, I think we'll see more of that, which is like giving to people like, this is outside of your realm of interests. Check this thing out. Right. But we had to come back around to that from a time when it was just like, there are 10 channels on and I see what's there. Right. And we're coming back around and we need some system of like, this is something you might like. Right. Where, and, and how to figure that out, I think is hopefully we'll get us out of the balkanization. Hopefully we're just in this, like there was all these new methods of creating content, all this new streams of ways that people could sort of isolate and pick. I just want to listen to this, or I only care about this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll see ourselves coming back to like, okay, I should, I should see what, you know, other people think is really interesting or this person's taste is so interesting. I like what they recommend. So it's just worth Anytime, anytime there's like a new medium created by technology, there is kind of like a chaos period at first. Yeah, and I'll tell you it's something the YouTube algorithm has found out about me. I'm actually really interested in the history of Hollywood. And oh, one of the yeah. things I love is so everybody remembers their grandma, like you know, like ah, movies are filthy nowadays. They weren't like that when when I was a young girl. Meanwhile, yeah. <laughs> like you know, like also there was a special man on the street who was molesting me. But I leave that part of the story out because I want to make <laughs> I want to spit shine the past anyway. Right. <laughs> And also, we didn't let any of those people on our block. It was better yeah, back then. And it then was they go, better. <laughs> but um, oh, where the fuck was it? Oh, so I, I have a big fascination with uh, the Hayes Code, which the Hayes Code was like, it was the rule, pretty much it, it was the, the content guidelines in film oh, okay. for the MPAA. So when uh, talking, when talking and like audio was added into film, it was a fucking free for all. And you have like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years where like there's movies in the thirties about a young girl who fucks her way to the top and is like, she's the, the heroine. That's like, yeah, awesome. Go fucking get it girl. And then yeah. in comes this haze dude. It's like, actually I have a Catholic priest friend and he says we shouldn't have that. <laughs> and that's when everything got like sanitized. And mm. you know, this is why people think the thirties like, yeah, Judy Garland over the rainbow. That's, that's all of it. And meanwhile, they had like, you know, fucking uh, openly gay characters and shit like that. Yeah. The other thing I've always heard about the history of film, not to get too off topic, but is that the introduction of sound also had sort of a, a chilling effect initially in terms of the, the creativity with like what the actual filmic image looked like. Right. There was this mm-hmm. moment of time where because the, the cameras had to be put in boxes because they were so loud mm-hmm. that if you wanted to have a mic around, you had oh, to like. yeah. So there was this like, because you had these like wild crane shots and you know, the, 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 uh, the great train, what, no, the train escape. No, no, the, 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 train the great, tra- great train robbery. Right, all these things that were like really experimental with like, where can I put my camera and what sort of shots can we get? Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, because of the introduction of the microphone and the, the cameras were these giant, you know, would make sounds. Right. They had to be put in boxes. And, and then also the problem of like the mics having to be set somewhere that you could talk to them because of their size at that point. Like, mm-hmm. so it's interesting that there was like, a, it, it, it's, I think it's right to use the word chaos. Cause right. there is like one hand of like, wow, all of the, everyone wants sound, but that means we have to stop, you know, these interesting shots. But with this new thing of sound, we could have these wild stories that, uh, you know, that we hadn't experimented with before. So it's, it, I think the right thing is to call it chaos. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested. I'll, I'll have to check that out because it does sound really cool. Those like countervailing streams. Oh, yeah. That, 
And I feel like we'll see that with uh, podcasting at a certain point. Mm-hmm. The number one thing I see happening with podcasts is like, I think the servers, like Libsyn right now, I just pay a monthly fee. Yeah. As podcasting gets bigger and like the, poten- the potential for profit engages, Libsyn's going to want their fucking cut. Yeah. That's what I think is going to happen. So. Yeah, the, the, the house always gets paid, right? Because yeah. until, until you manage to like actually be the one who's giving it in, you know, to a, a consumer, right? There's an intermediary and that person is going to have an interest. And I think even it just touches on like how desperate advertising is going to get the more people sort of pull away from traditional broadcast mediums. I, I don't know if you've, if you've hit much of that yet in the book, but like, you know, Libsyn, if Libsyn gets to be the way that people are going to get content, they are going to have a significant advertising power mm-hmm. that people are going to want um and in a certain sense podcasts also have this thing where they are like they're an intimate like people listen to it they have like a close connection with the host so mm-hmm. the host saying like oh i use you know i eat these gummy bears that make me feel calm or whatever like people are more likely to purchase them which is a very different tactic of advertising than i think what we saw with broadcast which is always like generate an anxiety and make you want to fix it right, right. like the podcast host can be the one who's like, I just like this underwear. And people are like, oh, that sounds nice. I'll go get that. Right. It's definitely like a, 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 a trust thing. Like, yeah. oh, well, you know, Jesse's never lied to me, which if you're mm-hmm. listening to this, I've lied to you dozens of times, you fucking rube. Anyway, listen don't to believe. the author podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't lie. I just improvise. That's all. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. I think what'll probably, what'll probably happen is those servers, they'll start, uh, they'll try to pick people off early where, because mm-hmm. obviously I don't make a dime on this podcast, right. which is, which is a shame because like this actually has a decent amount of traffic. It's just, mm. it's just not, I'm, I'm comparing that to other projects, not right. profitability. Sure. So um, what'll happen is I think they'll start getting people very early on where it's like also hey you could sign up for this service where like you'll save a dollar a month as long as you use one of these advertisers of ours and they'll try to be like the conduit to the advertising yeah it's i i I don't really know where it's going to end like because i think advertising is in one of these periods of like really intense transition where they're trying Mm -hmm. to figure out the best way to advertise to people as you know people my age cease watching television at all Mm -hmm. and there's not like a clear way to deliver ads to them Minus like, I have five seconds on YouTube. Oh, I'm gone, right? Like, so they're trying to find ways to work their way into the culture. And yeah, I think one of them is going to be, there's going to be like a podcasting, like, okay, we're going to give you a deal and you're going to be sponsored by us. You know, just like um, Steeply's like, put this brand, this thing on your car and we'll make it cheaper or whatever. Like put this Mm -hmm. advertisement on your car. So it's, people are trying because I think advertising is in a period of intense crisis. Oh yeah, definitely. That well, the, the whole thing they have uh, the eighteen to thirty nine male demo is the big one they get. By the way, I only know this because of wrestling, where ratings okay is a huge thing. That's but, right, because you're starting a wrestling review. I uh, yeah. So uh, I'll give a little backstory on that just because it's interesting. Yeah, um, it's it's fascinating. I've been in and out of wrestling my entire life. Mm. Like my uncle was a big time like wrestling promoter, not like WWF, but the thing that was big before WWF was big. Okay. And it's also WWE I don't know what now. I don't okay, know. okay, fine. okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the wrestling, the wrestling right. thing. Yeah. The point is, I've been in and out of it, and I realized the last few years I wasn't enjoying it as much. I was mainly keeping up on it based on this writer named uh, Brandon Stroud, who uh-huh. wrote for the site Uproxx. Now, okay. he, so he wrote every week these very humorous, hilarious, like, recaps of these terrible wrestling shows. Yeah. I feel like I kept up on the product more by reading that than I did actually watching it for a few years. Hmm. Well, during quarantine, turns out he's a fucking rapist. So uh, oh, he's no. been wiped clean from the internet. Hard and, cancel. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I hate to say it because it's always the case because I, I, I would consider myself like a left liberal open-minded person. Mm-hmm. But he was one of those guys that was always like, I gotcha, you went a little too far. And you just, those are always the guys, like he's going to be found with children's shoes in his closet with the feet still in him because he does protest too much. 
Right. No, it's, you're exactly right. Like that, there is this problem that we have, like, I don't know, anyone we make a hero, it's like, oh God, are we going to find out that the, oh no. Like the, the capacity for uh, just like horrible things in the closet, just like terrible, uh, uh, just, you know, terrible compulsions and problems that everybody seems to have is something that I don't think I realized was such a part of the world until at some point, A, all the heroes started falling. And I do think mm-hmm. reading Infinite Jest was a big moment where I was like, oh my God, all these people yeah. that are like really functional are maybe not all that good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh God. Well, that's, I feel like that's an important part of growing up. And it's yeah. something when I have kids, I need to tell them right away. Like, listen, adults don't know what the fuck they're doing at all. Oh, and before I get too far away from it. So pretty much... I lost reading that guy's articles and I couldn't really find anything. And then I found this website and I noticed they were looking for write-ups of this. So I said like, you know what, maybe I'll try and be that guy. Yeah. I, I haven't raped anyone. I, I don't <laughs> think, I mean, I hope I have a good memory in that. Re- that's, that's not funny. It isn't funny, but the, the, that moment of not, like, not funny. I think, but. I think it's not, not funny. I think what's funny is that moment that you go like, Okay, all my heroes have fallen. I don't think I've done anything bad, have I? Just that that doubt. The doubt is what's fun. That moment of doubt of yourself where you're like, I haven't done that, have I? Just that we are doing that is, you know, it's good, but it's a, it, makes, it makes one sort of like laugh because of the sudden change of time that, that we're like doing this sort of trying to do the self-reflecting. It's something I don't think, I don't think people would have been doing 10 years ago. Like I think now this, this impulse for self-reflection is so new that it's a little bit funny. I, oh, yeah. that, that's what I was sort of going like, wow. At. I mean, I'll tell you what, I am actually in the unique position that uh, having done comedy for a bit where there's a lot of those gotcha people, mm-hmm. I actually know how I'm going to at least attempt to be canceled if I ever look at, because I've had this psychopath literally send me a screen cap from six years ago. Well, actually, that would be a lie. They sent it to my girlfriend under the guise of like, you think you know who you're dating, but he said this. And whoa. Pretty much, it was 2014. I made a Facebook post where uh, I was making a point about the Washington Redskins name. Okay. And I used the N word uncensored, which, and I have no problem saying that because I'm I'm leaving it up because the fucking comments underneath there is the biggest thing that like gets me. Because mm. just to show how fucking long ago 2014 was, I saw this screen cap. I went and I looked at the comments. Like, oh god, what what did I say in here? It's four people talking, one of whom is a black man. And at no point was anyone like, well, I get the point, but you probably, you know, you could have done N dash, 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 dash. Like six years ago was that fucking long ago wow. that nobody thought of that. So, so yeah, if you ever see me get canceled, that'll, that'll be the screen cap they go for. Well, and I, I, I think it is really important to go like, wow, like how much we've changed. Like, and I think that there, this change is good, but it's good mm-hmm. to, we, you know, like we have to be able to see like, you know, it's good that we're not like that anymore. It's good that yeah. this thing wouldn't be acceptable, but that doesn't mean we need to like, if we forget where we've come from, we won't be able to like keep. So I, I hope you won't be canceled for that because I don't think it would be, wouldn't be a good use of the, pa- like can- um, canceling is such a powerful thing. Right. Like, and I wouldn't want it to be used when it shouldn't be. I want it to be used when it's appropriate. And I mean, we obviously see that with the the book itself and David Foster Wallace, Mm -hmm. which even though the name of the show is I Hate Infinite Jest, like I don't entirely approve of the kind of like, you know, uh, my my take my take is honestly, guys, it's not a bad book because David Foster Wallace did bad shit. It's just not a good book, which not right. That's where I'm getting at now. I'm realizing, like, though I am starting to like the book, mm-hmm. I st- it, it's still not hitting me as, like, great. So I'm, okay. I'm at a point where I'm getting it, but not entirely still. Right. Okay. Like, and when you say getting it, you mean, like, you are understanding what's happening? What, when you say getting it, what are you, like, getting why people well, like it or getting, what do you mean by getting, getting, getting it? Getting why people like it. That was my entire frustration with the book is not only didn't like it, I didn't get what anybody liked about it but now yeah. i'm far enough in but still the the life-changing aspect i don't know i don't yeah know. well so i i'm not sure why i was so because i i felt when i first when i first got my hands on infinite jest i felt sort of primed to like already get it and i think that mm-hmm. or like already want to un, want to like it um which is because the first time I ever read um, David Foster Wallace was like, I was just, I did my first act of like literary theft. Like I was in a Barnes and Nobles and I found a little copy of um, This Is Water, his commencement speech. Okay. 
And it is so unlike Infinite Jest in that it is like super tiny mm. and, on, and e on each page is like one sentence because it's so short and I wanted to like expand it out to a book, right? Um, and so I just like found this little thing with a picture of a goldfish on the front and devoured it, that, this little speech, mm. which, is, which has, I think, some of the same core concerns as Infinite Jest in terms of like our ability. This is a thing we're trying to do as people is to get is to improve our ability to understand others mm -hmm. somehow, or at least empathize with them. Right. And, and so in reading that and seeing that that was his core concern, because he gave that speech in 2008. So like, a, you know, world's different from 1993 or 94 when he was writing this book. Mm -hmm. So like, I think he had sort of pared down his message to something that then when I read this, when I read Infinite Jest, I was able to see like the sort of recurring theme of that. Mm -hmm. And was able to sort of hold on to it on the crazy ride through all the stuff that I was like, I don't think I should be reading this. Like, this is not <laughs> good. Like, oh, God. Um, and, then, and then also, I think the humor of it, something about the humor of it really delighted me early on. Like, just like his sense of like, like naming things. Like in this, in this section that we read, that we'll get to talking about notes, I get it. Like, wow. talking about... The, the union for the hideously and improbable deformed, mm -hmm. right? Like it only hits you in this passage really for me is when it's like, oh, you hid. Like the acronym is this bizarre pun that he was like building around to. And it like- it just, Paul, I'm a, I'm a fucking idiot and I didn't even put that together. Yeah, I, I just laugh. <laughs> Wow. The book at this point several times, but it, you know, they're talking cause it's about hiding and not hiding and you hid. And I'm like, wait, you, Oh, <laughs> like mm. there's all these layers of, I think it just works as a, as like a series of jokes. Like it's, yeah. it's just a hilarious experience. <laughs> you, you know, what's funny. We've heard of UHID before, but I mm. feel like it's only in this passage because he uses the word hide so yeah. many times where they talk about specifically the urge to hide and that being a bit of the shame. And uh, obviously they make the reference to, Pardon me. Uh, they make the reference to it being a little bit like AA, where instead of giving up your power to control your drinking, you're giving up the power over your desire to hide. Yeah, exactly. That, and like, and it is in that way sort of contrasted to AA, and and maybe said to be the same, right? It's like instead of in AA, you like say I am powerless, whereas in the the union for the hideously and probably deformed, you you somehow accept you're accepting your powerlessness by doing the thing you're ashamed of. Like it does, it does, I think Gately is, is right in saying that it sort of like bends the head to think about because it is such a, it's like a step above the circular logic of AA, right? It's this like, right. so you have to accept to hide. So you have to hide so you can accept that you're high. Like it, it is a crazy cycle of things to think about, but it's, it is in that way different than AA because AA is all about like in this group, we're totally honest mm. about ourselves. Whereas in this other one, we all accept that we hide. So it, it's a it's a it's an odd comparison and sim and similarity, but anyway, yeah, it's mm. it, it was it's really weird to read because I it makes my head hurt too trying to understand the logic that Joel Van Dyne is using. Yeah, but it's I, I guess it's necessary to show that a little bit just so we're also sympathizing with Gately, who obviously feel does not like people lording their intelligence over him. Um, yeah. You know what? All right. Typically, we just go strict through the notes, but I'm actually kind of liking us going in and out. So okay. I'm going to try to give just like little chunks here so we can keep talking about it. Yeah, that. sure, sure, sure. Okay. So we when we riff. open, we have uh, it's Gately and Joel talking, and Gately has a whole story about uh, him and his friends going to a bar. <gasps> Walking like off the gunshot? <laughs> like yeah. <it's> <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah, one, the of, one, of, one of his boys is hitting on a girl who's there with her guy. Yeah. And they smack the guy around, he leaves, which Gately notes is always the wrong thing to do in a neighborhood bar because the guy it's... always comes back. Yeah, don't stay, is he saying no. when he's learned. Don't stay. Don't stay. <laughs> and, and they're playing strip darts when he comes back. Mm. <laughs> Just it's like a bizarre detail. So the Ugh. guy comes home, grabs a gun, and blows the guy's brains out right there in the bar. And Gately and his friends being so fucked up, they just kind of like pick him up and walk him around. Like you, when you try to like cut... You know, come on, buddy, sober up, get some Walk air, it get off. some air. Yeah, the phrase that, start, that, start, that uh, sticks with me is always like, they were, they were so drunk, it seemed like a movie, right? right? Like, which seems relevant to other things in the book, right? That, like, they're so, they're, whatever it is that they go to alcohol for, it's to make these sorts of experiences just be like, oh, it's just happening, I don't know. 
right? That that uh, mm -hmm. anesthesia is part of what they are doing with their boiler boiler makers, boiler plates. What are they? What is that? Oh no, it's a boiler maker because I'm a fan boiler. of boiler makers. Yeah, it's so. you know, it's it's effective for certain for yeah. sure. Like being in Philly, you we we know what a citywide is. That's like mm. a PBR pounder and a shot of whiskey. And I've always been a fan. I don't like shots, so I've been a fan of just pouring the whiskey right into the beer for my uh, boiler maker. Yeah, true. That's true. I forgot about the citywide. It's been a while since I've been out in Philadelphia. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. Ugh, God. Well, yeah. The only places we've been, they've been setting up these little beer gardens where it's nothing like you can't mm. get a citywide. It's like a beer with a fucking orange in it. But, oh God. Uh, it's, it, it comes with the territory. Going through all that. <laughs> uh, Philly's gotten stranger since I've. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Uh -huh. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I was, I was going to keep going on about the, they, they, they think that he's going to be fine if they just walk him around and he ends up, they mm -hmm. just started, and they end up just dragging him around the bar and Joel is just like, what? And they have that interesting moment of connecting on like how blood spurts when you're injured. And uh -huh. Joel's like, oh yeah, all that when my, you know, my daddy was, you know, had to put a tourniquet on somebody who cut his hand off. Right. So they've both seen some like really great, I mean, I, we don't know how much more Joel has seen, but like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just had an interesting thought on that the other day because it reminded me of uh, reading this earlier in the week because on Friday, mm -hmm. we went to my girlfriend's family's for Rosh Hashanah. Okay. And, uh, we did it all in the backyard and I get there and her mom asked me, how are you with dealing with dead birds? Like, in what regard? There, there was a blue jay dead in her backyard that she wanted thrown out. We ended up burying it. But then yeah. me and my girlfriend are looking and we noticed like, oh, there's no head on this thing. But also there's no blood, which made us realize, Oh, so this thing was attacked by like a house cat, yeah. beaten to death, and only then was the head bitten off because it didn't spurt everywhere. Yeah, there was right. No heart going. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, that's wild. What a, what an interesting observation. Because there's also a dead bird in this passage we just read. Yes. Like <laughs> where Lens, you know, one of Le one of Lens's things is that he gets a bird and he puts it in the garbage disposal, but he doesn't quite feel satisfied. Sorry, I'm jump I might be jumping ahead. I need to go in order. No, 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 no. Like I said, I'm liking this little bit of a looser uh, format. But okay, yeah. good. Yeah, as as long as that's okay, because I, I, you know, the the format of going down the notes is great. I, I, I'm I'm just I don't know. I just enjoy it so much. No, so no, that's okay. It's I, I can I can feel you got a little bit of the gift of gab too when you can riff a little bit. This is the way I prefer to do it. The way I have it set up is more for the benefit of the guest because right. not, not everybody you know can be bipping and bopping or sure you're an improv zip zap zopping i guess so <laughs> zip zap zop ah oh, yes uh but order is nice as well for people i imagine people who are listening who are like what is happening <laughs> you know like this is the oh, other yeah. the improv starts to stress you know the riffing and the viewer the listeners like what, what, were we in a bar? Where are we now? Although that's very relevant to what it feels like reading the book. So I feel like if anyone has made it this far, they can probably tolerate a bit of, <laughs> a right. bit of riffing around. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm curious to see what I, I actually, I went and I scheduled all my, I don't have the guests yet, but I just like okay. figured out like what chunk of the book. And I realized like, man, I'm going to be done this in like December at this mm. current rate. And yeah. I have no clue what I'm doing at the end of it. None. Right. What would be a proper capstone? Like, what is the way, I, I mean, I think what you'll, you'll get to the end and you'll want to figure out like some, something to do as a summation, some mm. way to like round out the experience. Um, and, you know, I can talk to you then as well. Cause I'm also trying to like withhold things. Cause I've already, I've already read it and I'm like trying to, Oh God, I can't. I've had, I, I have had people spoil a lot of this for me. So okay. Uh, if you're, if you're somehow listening to this and being really, really strict, skip ahead 30 seconds. Um, I know I know something about Gately waking up naked on a beach in like a rebirth thing. I know uh -huh. we don't find out exactly what happens to Hal, which well, is a little infuriating. I, okay, I am of the opinion that you do. And I think it okay. becomes, I, I, so I think, keep skipping ahead if, you've, if we've made it already 30 seconds. I think what you'll want to do when you get to the end of the book is just read the first chapter again. And what will happen is there's information that you were, that was put in the first chapter that doesn't mean anything because it's uh -huh. sort of like one half of a bit of information. Like it's like names that you don't have any points of reference for or okay. bits of information that don't mean anything that once everything is swimming in your head, you read the first chapter and you sort of see this like, oh, I can make the like A to C leap to understand sort of what occurred, mm -hmm. I think, is what you'll okay. experience. And so what you could do is do a like, final episode where you just reread the the year of glad 
and then talk about that with somebody because that might be a great way to like that's probably the route i'll yeah. go i think i think I'm, I'm probably gonna end up changing the name of my podcast and i'm i think what i'll probably end up doing is just make it like things people are fanatical about that i pick apart and shit on a little bit i don't know mm. we'll see yeah, the, the you could the howling fantoid, uh, fantasy you could call it, I guess. The, there you go. I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure nobody else has the title. I don't know. Yeah, gets it from this. Maybe. Yeah, that the, the, I have a really crazy experience where I will search for something that's in this book, thinking like, oh, like I'm looking up a definition, and it like pulls up only results about infinite jest. There's just like so yeah. many things in this book that if you try to look them up, what the one that is right at the start of the section is, I wanted to look up this phrase shout or do do you is this a is this clean or is it explicit the podcast I say whatever you want okay like when when right at the start of the section when she says like i didn't know whether to shout or shit dixie i was like uh -huh. that's that's an excellent phrase like that has to that has to exist and it doesn't like if you look up that exact phrase like with quotes all you get are hits for this book hmm. And See, I, I actually had that because I've been trying to bring back the word of the week. And when we get to it, apparently it's a word that David Foster Wallace made up for this section. You know, excellent. Fuck it. I'll go ahead now. I'll tell you what it is. Yeah. Our word of the week. Hold on. I might have to do a. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here. quivering with anticipation. Okay. From uh, about. So this is about Kate Gompert's reaction to cocaine. Our word of the week made up by David Foster Wallace is. Blafaro specticity. Oh, yes. the brain bleeding. Is that the one that if because she, she's taking Parnate or uh, uh, they, they, they mentioned that uh, the, the, the follow up of that is she, okay. Okay. it said she can't do coke. She oh, now she would be because mm -hmm. of this. And if she did coke now, it would cause instant cerebral hemorrhage due to her medication. But the word <laughs> right. Blafaro specificity means seeing through one's eyelids. <laughs> Whoa, that is a great word. <laughs> Blaros, oh my God. Because I, I was trying to guess word. which word you pick. That's excellent. That's, that's so, I was like, I was like, will it be, because the other thing about this section that's really wild is like, um, there's a lot of words that Lentz just gets wrong. Like you yeah. think it's a word you don't know, but it's just like a misspelling. Like it's mm -hmm. littered with misspellings because he's like, it's, he, it's, how, it's the commitment to Lentz's character. Like Lentz mishearing things and Lentz yeah. like, having words that are just mis that are just wrong. Um, but well, see, but that, that is such a that, good that catch. Is the thing, that is the thing I hit on last week with Josh Gondelman that I really has kind of recontextualized the way I read the book mm. and also how much I put the blame on David Foster Wallace <laughs> afterward is where he uses this like soft third person narration. And what I mm -hmm. mean by soft third person narration is when Randy, like when those things we see with Randy Lenz where it's misspelled, where he doesn't get the words, like those aren't quotes of his, that isn't dialogue the thing is saying. It's being written from the third person of someone describing Lens, but it's using the vocabulary Lens would use. Yeah, it's a crazy claustrophobic third person. It is like the yes. narrator is like right here and is, is close enough to hear everything that this person is thinking and put it down and also like see other details that they're not catching. Cause that's the part that always infuriates me. I'm like, how, if I'm getting it from Lenz's perspective, do I know things that he doesn't know? Right. But like, that's just the game that Fidea Foster Wallace plays so well is like, you are seeing it almost out of their eyes, but just backed up ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's wild. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Okay, so let's run through these notes again. Real yeah, quick. let's keep going. Uh, Gately asks Joelle, what's with the veil? My personal favorite fake answer she gave is she was an aspiring Muslim. You know, uh, the bridal thing. Oh, yeah. Silence. <laughs> aspiring Muslim. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's another moment that I have that I just cackle. I just, the, the book can make me cackle. And I think that's a good reason to read it, for, I, in my perspective, is that like there's something, a way that Dave Foster Wallace accomplishes the humor that is great with that, with like moments like that. I, I feel like I'm, I'm enjoying it more with other characters than others. Like the kids, I don't find funny at all. Pemulus gets off a line every now and again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Pemulus uh, is Joelle, Joelle has some wit to her. Joelle um, does, yeah. So we find out she's four years into the union of the hideously and improbably deformed. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Gately notes her deformity isn't apparent. She says upon joining, there's a full veiling ceremony and that no mortal eye will see it withdrawn. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. here, all right, here's something you can probably spoil for me, but I'm okay. unsure because I feel like she says it here. 
is her deformity the fact that she has no deformity? Is this really just like a, I'm sick of people looking at me? Well, so what she says in this section, right? Okay. Like, what she says is, I'm so beautiful, I'm deformed, right? Like, uh-huh. and now the, the things that we already know, we already know that when she overdosed, she got sort of magically bumped into the house, right? Like she was not, she was not on the waiting list because right. like she, she got taken to the hospital. The doctor, you know, like was working on her, saw her face and was so taken with her case that he, you know, made sure that he would help her or whatever, uh-huh. right? Like, so there is, there is a little bit of evidence thus far that something is special. Something happens when people see her, right? We uh-huh. know. Well, see, I, I, I actually just attributed that to, um, oh God, you know what? I'm really not thinking. I, I just always attributed that to her relation with James and Candenza, only realizing I'm not sure if James has any connection with Ennett other than geographical proximity to Enfield. Right. The, the, yeah, exactly. So there's, there's, he, James, I don't remember if we've learned about this yet, but he like was in and out of AA, right? But I don't know that he would have ever crossed paths with the house. He does have some connection with the co- the compound, right? right? Because of the construction, right? Uh-huh. Like, so there's the one house that's sort of like covered with, like when they lever- leveled the top of the field right. of the, of the, one of the satellite things. But no, like, I don't think there was any reason that, you know, when Joel was taken to the hospital, that her connection to James and Condenza would have meant that she would have gotten special access to the house. Because that, yeah. I don't think he's like, he's not on the board or whatever. And his only relationship with her at this point is like, you know, the, the money. Like he, he set up an, uh, some sort of annuity that she gets, right, at, right. right, that, you know, enables her habit as well. So mm-hmm. the, the only reason she seemed to end up in the house is the doctor was working on her as friends with Pat. And the doctor was so moved that he was able to get her. Oh, and the doctor who was working on her is on the board of that house or whatever. So what I mean to try and suggest is that we don't actually know because that doctor might have just actually been moved. He's he's on this board and maybe he wanted to put her in the house. But so far, that's the only person we know who's seen her is that doctor who did that. So it's hard to it's hard to tell if she is just joking around with Gailey, if she's just using humor to continue hiding. Right. Um, but we do, do end up yeah, I guess we're gonna this out. more about what happened. Look like I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, so you're breaking, you're breaking um, up a little better. It kind of choked up a little. It's no, okay. Hold on for a few seconds. The, am I back now? No, no, am you're I, back now. You're fine. Okay, okay, okay. It's literally, so, it's, literally, it's literally going from picture perfect to like several seconds of weirdness. So it's not like it's, we're losing big chunks. Ugh, the internet is such an odd, odd thing. So, um, but we do learn more about what happened that went from Joel being not veiled to veiled. We do get that. We do learn about that eventually. Um, and I sort of am hesitant to reveal it to you unless okay. you like if, if, it, if, it, if it hasn't been revealed to me, I don't need to know. Cause that okay, was, great. Uh, Cause I was, I was unsure. I was kind of taking her at her word here because yeah. Because it, well, it would also flow directly into the entire premise of the entertainment overall is just something that somebody can't look away from. And I'm also spoiled because I remember in the, uh, the Vonnegut book, I think it was Dead-Eyed Dick, where they talk in detail. And I think it's a character who was also mentioned in the background of Breakfast of Champions, who was like a very girl from the wrong side of the tracks, who mm-hmm. was beautiful, but she mm-hmm. like resented everybody's love of her beauty. And she actually says repeatedly like, if I die and go to heaven, I want to ask God what the hell he wrote on my face that made people want to read it all the time because I don't get it. Yeah. So there is definitely something about that. We've already learned a little bit about um, Oren and the right. pea-goat, right? So we've already, right. we've already learned a little bit about that, about how she, the effect she has. Mm-hmm. Exactly what that effect is, I don't know. The other thing that we learned in this section is that, um, that it's worth pointing out and noting uh, we're, I think we're almost, are we almost there? Oh no, we're not, we're not quite there in the notes yet. Um, eh, whatever, just bring it up, it's fine. But to just jump ahead a little bit, what we learn in the section, in this where we learn from the perspective of Rodney Tyne, which is hilarious and comical uh-huh. of reasons we'll get to, is that in the entertainment, there is a veiled woman. Yes. So, so like- well, I, can, I, I feel like they've given enough context at this point that we realize that she was the woman in, in the entertainment. Yeah. But we've gotten that much. I wasn't aware she was veiled yet at that point. That's really the first, that's the first new bit of information I've had about. Yeah. So, so something, something about her image is important, Mm. but if it is just that just looking at her normally would make her so beautiful that it would make people sort of slobber over her. 
either, I, I don't, it's unclear at that particular moment. And again, you're going to find out there is something to the to her that uh, that has changed about her from when she was in college okay. and twirling batons to now that she has the veil on. And okay. what that is is worth noting what that is. And also, I think it connects to the other characters that she has played in Incandenza's work. So it's like if you're like okay. wanting to like pull apart things and look for things she has done and how it might be connected to what she looked like in the entertainment or what she looks like now, you want to look for like what other roles she has played. Okay, you know what, let's actually hit the notes for that section because it's not really necessary to the chronology anyway. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 548, 549, we have Rodney Tyne, Chief U.S. Office of Unspecified Services, has one blackmailable <laughs> thing about him, and Paul, what is that one blackmailable thing? Every single day, whether or not he's at home or away, he measures the size of his unit. Every single day. <laughs> and you know what it is? I hate, I hate to say this as a man, that as strange as a detail that is, at least myself as a man, it's like, well, it's weird, but I get it. I, you know what? It, it is such a good character detail because it just tells me something about like what kind of person he is, right? Like that he needs to know this is mm -hmm. interest is like, and why you would need to know it every single day. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, a fear of changing, a fear of growing older. I don't know, but it opens the possibility. And just, I think that one detail will enough to be like, oh, I know exactly what this person is like now. Like, mm -hmm. I know so much about him, mm -hmm. which is why it's the blackmailable detail. Right. No. See, I, so I, it's, I, it's I, kind I, of a cheat because he, what? No, go ahead. Go on, go on. No, no, I, I was just going to. Well, I just think what's so, what's so clever. <laughs> Sorry, we're a little, we're a little, little out of sync here. I'm, you go ahead. My I thing know, is not I'm important. Totally, My thing I, is a dumb anecdote. <laughs> Okay, I will. I want to hear your dumb anecdote. I just wanted to say that as a as a person interested in writing, it's a hilarious way to open a, a moment because mm -hmm. what it does is it tells you the absolute core detail you need to know about the character, right? Which is something that is usually you have to like carefully build up to, and it is like so hilariously opened with, uh -huh. right? Like as a writer, he's like, here is the core of this person's identity, right? Which is normally <laughs> something you like build beautiful passages around. He's like, he measures his penis. Okay, now other stuff. Anyway, okay, so tell me your dumb anecdote. Oh, okay. it, it, it's not gonna be any good now. But uh, the joke I would make, because this has come up with me and my girlfriend before, where you know, you're just walking around the house with your partner and you give them a little grope. And they'll say like, hey, and the thing I would say is, and I think it applies to this, like, just making sure it's still there. Like, I know <laughs> it's there. It's just, guys, I, I know it was six and a half inches yesterday, but I mean, what if it how do I know for now for certain Unless I check. Yeah, absolutely. I, really, I, I hope there's a payoff with this. I mean, is this going to be like Chekhov's penis? Is this going to be like ripped off by a feral hamster somewhere? I'm trying to think if there's a payoff with the, the penis. But the, the thing about Rodney Tyne, mm -hmm. hold on, am I getting confused? Rodney Tyne is the one who's rumored to have, he's because he's the closest advisor to, um, to President Gentle. Yeah. And I think that he, he is the one who was rumored to have the relationship with, uh, oh, what's her name? The French, the, the little uh, L, uh, L, LP, what is it? L something. Anyway. The, it's, it's, it's not Fortier. I don't know why I want to say Fortier. Well, because that Fortier was the one who was running the, uh, one of the separatist movements. Yes. Before. Okay. Okay. Terrible death. But it's something plus, it's French, but it's, it's her first name's L and her last name's P. Right. right? And so, so there, there is something about his, there, we know other details or we will, there are other things that are related to his like sexual activity uh -huh. that we learn about. So I don't, I don't know, I can't remember if the penis means anything, but we do know that there's something also about his masculinity that fa factors into his, uh, his loyalties. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, so he is in Boston because of word of the entertainment. They hear right. about two thirds of an avant-garde film festival before a janitor cut the power. Yeah. Um, <laughs> usual, numerous law enforcement agents have been lost just trying to describe it. It and, played out the same way as it played out uh, with the medical attaché, right? And yeah. it has happened, I think, three other, so four times total that there have been sort of mass dying offs, like, met, like, right. like, like with this thing, right? And no one knows anything about it yet, except for the people like in the Office of Unspecified Services, like, right. which is really weird in the middle of a pandemic that we're like, they knew about it before we knew about it. And then yeah. we're, it's like, it, <laughs> it literally smacks of the same sort of government attitude. So it's just like really, it was really interesting to note. Like The, the, the little detail that I feel like could have been drawn right from the headlines right now is uh president gentle has had to be talked out of watching it several times because he's a dickhead now let, let me see what this is all about 
I, but I, I want to. It's just like with Marath and, uh, Marath and Steeple when they talk about people lined up to like uh, get the, the things probed in them. Oh, like, yeah, the, the, the pleasure electrodes. Yes. Gentle is just the same. Like Gentle wants – Gentle is the person who wants that. Right. Like, so it is, it is hilarious because it also tells you so much more about Gentle. Although I, I – you know, like we've learned a lot about him so far. But, like, that's one of those things that, like, that's a real detail rather than one from, like, the puppet show that we didn't know how to verify. Or, right, right. Well, well yeah, they, they flat out, like, it, they say right in there, like, some of it is fact and some of it is, like, jokes made up for the movie. But we don't have any of the context to know which is which. Yeah, right. Which that comes up, I think, a lot in this section. That, like, how much do we actually know of what's going on and how much is sort of, like conspiracy or other thoughts or whatever. And so what's interesting about this is this is a, like a very straightforward little section in the right. midst of a bunch of things that we like, don't know right. how real it is or not. Yeah, what I like is we just get like facts. Like we have here yeah. uh, a sociopathic and retarded, again, I'm just reading things. Sociopathic and retarded Lance Corporal had been strapped down with electrodes and a headset recorder, was <laughs> able to report that it opens with a shot of a veiled woman through a large building's revolving doors, catching a glimpse of somebody else in the revolving doors making her veil billow. Mm -hmm. And that is as far as we could see in the Samizdat before the uh, break stuff. And yeah. the possibility of the dissemination from Canada is what has brought Tyne here to Boston. And that's yes. all I have for that little section. Yeah, no, I, I, think that's, I think that's everything that's worth knowing. But also there's that hilarious, again, there's just hilarious details. The, 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 un, the Office of Unspecified Services has an anti-anti-Onan activities agency uh -huh. underneath of it, which is just, I, so it's like the US, so wow, I, I don't know. It's just the ridiculous <laughs> acronyms. It's just like, and yeah. that's what's paying steeply. Like that is, the off, that is the Office of Unspecified Services agency that is footing the bill. We get that in that right. footnote, that they're footing okay. the bill for his, his current yeah. ex, his activities as well. We're, so we're, we're, we're getting a lot of catch 22 in here where we're having kind yeah. of like the, uh, the real sat satirization of uh, <laughs> just like, you know, well, you know that I pretty much, it all, it all comes back to this is Ralph Cramden, Jackie Gleason. You know that I know that you know that I know that you know that I know. And that's yeah. it, but it, we're having a fun time with it. It's fun confusion. <laughs> well, and the other thing is that there is like sort of that, that catch 22 level plot of infinite jest. Cause there, there are lots of deep, really interesting things going on, but there is on one level, like it could be enjoyed just as a, political comedy thriller thing mm. of like the national security implications and the the ridiculousness of onan and all of these things like you could just you could just get that out of it and mm. so we're getting some of that right now which is really wild mm. so yeah so let's see what did we skip over before we um, before we you know, jumped ahead we actually wasn't a bad thing that we skipped over because cool. pretty much uh rodney tyne just kind of Oh, okay. So all we have, all the other things we have in here, we have the little bit of Pemulus in the office at a different time, and then everything else yeah. is Randy Lenz. So yes, you know what? In order to talk about the Randy Lenz thing more thoroughly, let's jump ahead to the Pemulus thing. Okay, that makes Randy sense. Randy Lenz is like interrupted, but it's not like it really needs to be. Yes, absolutely. So Pemulus goes to the dean. Presumably, yes. I mean, he's he's dressed in the most ridiculous, ins oh, okay. insolent I, outfit. I, I literally have in my notes, Pemulus is wearing a ludicrous <laughs> outfit that I will not devote another word to. I know, it's, but it's so exquisitely, like various moments you get other things described. It's, he looks ridiculous. Mm. Possibly for the reason, like, because he, I think he knows the effect he tends to have on Avril, right? Like he right. knows and so he is trying to push that, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why that would be his strategy before he shows up, but that's what he, that's his plan, is that he's in bad shape and his plan is to upset her. I don't get it, but right. anyway. And uh, important thing to note, this is actually the last chapter. We had the whole thing where they're in the office awaiting the results of uh, the Eschaton fallout. This scene, however, takes place two days before that. Oh, does it? That's yes, right. It does. Oh my gosh. Well noticed. Oh, uh, wow. I, I was trying to pay attention to that because I wanted to know what happened in the office. So I noted the date and then I went forward a hundred pages and they still didn't fucking get to it. Yeah. Cause yeah, that happens November 11th. This chunk right here is very specifically November 9th, both year yeah. of the dependent undergoment. That's really interesting. Cause I, I hadn't noticed that as I was, as I was reading, I just assumed it came afterwards and yeah. Wow. So like, well, I mean, it's a nice little coloring on what they're like. Yes. They're going to be facing some uh, trouble for the eschaton thing going into the office, but Pemulus clearly has something over Avril now. Yeah. At the, at the least. I mean, it doesn't seem like they were being too careful, but nonetheless, he does seem to know. 
Yeah, he's in the know, which we'll get to what he's in the know of. There's all these things he notes in the office. He's listening to um, Tavis on his stair blaster, uh-huh. right? Total worry, total worry. Uh, or... really great line here on yeah. just I, I hadn't realized Tavis was a little chubby, but the uh-huh. quote I have here. Penniless could envision Tavis's round belly and little titties of fat bouncing with the action of the stair blaster. <laughs> and the yeah, his hair yeah. off the one side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Tavis is more fully articulated as how absurd mm. he is there. But uh, so, yeah, so we have Pemulus steps by an overlit dean of academic affairs office and sees John Wayne wearing a football helmet and shoulder pads and athletic supporter and nothing else down in a three point stance, which uh, if those <laughs> listening aren't particularly sports minded, when you see football, when they're like lined up with one hand down right before the ball is thing and then they run at each other that position and uh and avril is in there wearing a green and white cheerleaders outfit doing a split in front of him and blowing a broken whistle while john wayne grunts yeah it's it's quite the image it's yeah. really something. <laughs> uh, avril avril spots pemulus who says out loud i probably won't waste everybody's time asking if i'm interrupting which is a great fucking line oh good it is it is a beautiful tableau. Like yes. it is so shocking to get to see, right? Mm-hmm. It is, I, oh man. <laughs> and the implications, right? Which are like, okay, so there's, John Wayne's a student, right? Like what, yes. it, what, like all of these things that are like suddenly in that moment mm-hmm. charged. Uh, I, it, I, and like what that, what it tells you about Avril, like, like how much you start to understand more about what's going on with Avril mm. is, is why <laughs> it's, yeah, a, I, it's, I know, I, I know enough that Avril has a very voracious sex appetite, but mm-hmm. so far we haven't dipped into that so much. Mostly we've just been getting other people's uh, effects on her. I believe it was Oren's coach who actually, when he quit the, the tennis team at his college, weeped and asked is your mom still gonna come and watch the game <laughs> yes. that's right which also speaking of Oren, like then there's so there's the like oh what, what are the implications for what's happening between these two but then there's like why does she have him dressed up as a football player like why oh, yeah, that, the, that's the thing. it's not just sex it's weird like we yeah. don't and we don't know what either of them is yes. getting out of it yet at this point Right. But it's, you know, it's like, it is, it is that moment where you're like, oh, this is, this is proper. This isn't just like sex drive. This is dysfunction, right? In uh-huh. some way, Th- this is something dysfunctional that's going on. It connects her to that sort of, this whole, the whole family's dysfunctional in their, in their own ways. Right. And so it is, it is deeply dysfunctional. And that is a, that's a lens we don't get to see much of Avril because she's so, or maybe dysfunctional is the wrong word. It is, um, compulsive right like Uh it is so it's compulsive there's something not healthy about it whereas the rest of the time she looks like exorbitantly functional incredibly Mm. thorough and detailed and organized and this is one of those brief glimpses where like oh there's something else going on right that's why i think that is so significant um yeah i had a tiny little thing on ortho stice who's also there he's visiting dr rusk and uh yeah he's upset about his bed right he says something about his bed which is interesting to note. Yeah, it's uh, the main thing I have here is he's been diagnosed with counterphobia, which <laughs> fear mis- of linoleum. Yeah, that's what he mistakes it as. Uh, she explained it's due to a fear of weights. This obviously ties in somewhere with Lyle. Don't let the weight thou try to pull exceed thine own weight. I don't know. It comes up. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yes, the I would say this whole section because in this bit I don't know as I don't know if it's so much like. Uh, that shows that Rusk has like a really clever insight because Orthos Orthostice is like, I, I, what are you saying? It doesn't make any sense. Like this is, an, I don't play with action figures, and he's yeah. like upset about something else. And so the the other thing that I think is really interesting about getting this section here and this little bit about psychology here is also in the lens section in a very specific way. Dave Foster Wallace is sort of making fun of psychology and how it how it works in our lives when we're having uh-huh. problems, right? Because here it just seems totally ineffective, right? He's like, "What? I, I don't understand what you're saying. I have this problem. And she's like, you need to stop thinking about the problem. <laughs> right. Like, and he's just like, I have no idea what's going on. Um, and I think it's one of the ways that Dave Foster Wallace seems to, at various times, even though he takes psychological issues very seriously, 
he seems to also mock our, our, the ways we interface with psychology sometimes, mm. right? Like the way we try to like either diagnose ourselves in the case of Lentz, like Lentz is like, yeah, the, this thing describes me and that, that's, a, this is good, right? Like he takes it as confirmation mm. and here, Ortho seems to have some sort of problem that Rusk is unable to like help him with, really, because she's too stupid. right. She she seems like she is caught up. There's a little bit of she's kind of caught up in her own bullshit to a certain extent, mm -hmm. enough so that she's trying to help him. He's like, "Gi, I don't play with GI Joes anymore." Where of course she's yeah. talking about her his gastrointestinal issues. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I would love, with that kind of insight, I really wonder what Dave Voss Ross would have said now, where I feel like we're kind of at a peak of like self diagnosis. Uh, yeah. Not only when you talk about people on the spectrum who, uh, obviously, I'm not saying it's illegitimate in any way, but like it's mm -hmm. very, a lot of people. Fuck, I actually had a falling out with a friend recently, and <laughs> I, I, I had a joke. Ah, no, fuck him. Um, I. <laughs> I, I had had a joke that sort of it, it was it was a little edgy because it was about somebody mm. like differently able it somebody who didn't exist but this friend of mine got so angry and pissed off at me and blah 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 I'm like oh well buddy I'm sorry you feel that way and I find out after like oh no he read something and self diagnosed himself as autistic so it wasn't like it wasn't like he was upset at that poor person in the story it's like oh no that's me now so he got all upset yeah. Yeah, I so you know the '90s saw a huge explosion in self-help, right? Like so, like that right. was on that was on its rise at that time, um, and so that and that is its own phenomenon that goes into the internet and goes sort of like hyperbolic with like we can you know WebMD will tell you that you have some sort of terrible disease, yeah. well before you've ever spoken to a professional. Mm -hmm. um, in the context of infinite jest, I don't know, like because I think that you know there's such there's such sincere treatment of people with compulsions with problems who are trying to work through it and get better, right? Like there is this, this, this really interesting lens trained on that because I think David Foster Wallace was someone who experienced those things. Right. But there is, I mean, like you just think all the way back to Kate Gromper when she's like trying to talk to the, the doctor. Right. And he is there, right? Notes. Oh no. Okay, well, no, no, we, we lost it. We heard Kate Gompert, and that was it. So if you want to keep going with Kate okay. Gompert. Okay. Yeah, like with, with Kate Gompert, the, the doctor that she's talking to, the, uh, he's not an intern, but he's on his like final, what that final stage is before you're uh, yeah, like yeah, giving your you. doctorate, whatever. The, I'm forgetting the term. But, you know, he is being perfect. He is doing what psychology says is the perfect way to be like listening, taking the right notes, connecting everything she's saying. And it's just very clear that there is this terrible gap where like, mm -hmm. He, she's not really being understood, right? Like right. she's not really being helped. And I think that is what he, what Dave Foster Wallace is sort of drawing the distinction between is that maybe, maybe just like a diagnosis isn't exactly what we should be going for. Like we should be trying to understand ourselves right. and work through it rather than like, oh, here's your problem, have your electroshock, right? Like, cause that's what she asks, what Kate Gromberg asks all the time. Like, can you just get rid of it? And mm -hmm. I think he would say like, the interesting thing is why we're so unhappy why do we have that compulsion mm -hmm. and how could we by understanding that not absolve ourselves of our sadness or of our depression or of our compulsion but be able to control it or in some way work through it mm -hmm. i guess like and, i think that's his take on it right and that's obviously a theme you know throughout the book i mean the entire notion of aa and they they, they talk about it in aa but specifically with gately how like the sobriety itself isn't that bad. It's when you're alone with your thoughts and now you have to confront them. That is yes. the bad part that like messes everybody up because you have nothing, you know, you've been burying yourself, burying these terrible memories under happy juice. And then one day you don't have the happy juice and you're stuck looking right at it. Yeah. You're stuck looking at the things that made you drink in the first place. Right. Like, okay, and that, that is, I, and I think as you'll see, our, one of the things that we as a reader, I think one of the reasons Gately's story is so compelling is the whole thing is our, we're, we're journeying to get to understand what his bottom is, both all the mm -hmm. things that made him drink initially, and we're finding out what is Gately's actual bottom, because we haven't gotten that yet. And you, and getting really? there is really, yeah. Okay. I, I, think, I think it's one of the most clearly, um, like as you get to the end of the book, you'll see that the, the whole thing is about getting us to see what Gately's bottom is. Okay. And, and and how he's like having to work through that or change or get better right okay. that's so well, I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to that I exa still, exactly I, I still like find he was the gateway stuff the most engaging stuff in the book so 
I, I, and my general sense of it with Gately, I, we're getting a little off from, from Lens, but my general sense with Gately is that he is the one in the book that David Foster Wallace is, is posits as like the one who there is hope for because right. he, has, he has the thing that he was doing in the first bit of the passage we're reading where he's trying to empathize, right? Mm-hmm. Like he goes like, I, I totally ID with that, right? And he just does the things that, are, that they say are helpful without trying to understand them. Mm-hmm. He's less trapped in his brain and say Hal, like Hal can reason his way out of anything. Like Hal right. could be like, I'm doing this because I want to, or you know, like Hal can find a reason to justify anything. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of what traps Hal. Same with his father. Like his father couldn't commit to AA because he just like couldn't get over the AA stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Gailey is the one who is in a certain sense freer because he's less trapped in his brain. Right, okay. Yeah. All right, so let's dip into Lens, which is let's junk. dip into Lens. <laughs> what I mean, this this is one of the passages that's hard, like initially, like quite hard to read, right? Uh-huh. Like because it's it's. I mean, he is he's totally relapsed, right? Like we learned pretty early on that he is, uh, like he says something because it's from his perspective. He says something along the lines of like, you know, like he's used he's used being he's used cocaine once or twice or maybe half a dozen times, right? Like there's this like yeah. He's just relapsed, right? right. Like, so it's very like, I'm clear. Not, I'm not having fun with it. I need it. I only have as much as I need. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I only have enough cocaine to keep me sober. That's the important thing. Here. I am so special. Right. His, mm-hmm. his, in his mind, he is so special that, you know, everyone else, there. This I'm sober. Like, he, he gets his sobriety chip with a clear conscience. He's like, this yeah. is sober for me, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> which is part of his disease, right? The, the, you know, like he's just so convinced that I'm different from all of these other people and that's why I need this, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it, I think part of what's going on is it should be abundantly clear to everyone around him that he has relapsed. Yeah. <laughs> like there is no way. Well, like, they, they, like they, he, you know, they, he, they seem he, to he hit got on into, that. that the, he seems to have all like the characteristics of someone that's relapsed, but like he's hiding it just well enough. And the main thing is he keeps passing the piss tests. So yeah. Right, exactly. And so, and that is really interesting that he, he is the sort of person that knows how to work the system, mm-hmm. that knows how to be addicted and like be getting through it. He's only there, he's only actually in the halfway house this time, I think, because he wants to hide, right? That's why he goes out in the wig and everything. Like he's using it as a place to, you know, I hide. Had, he's I hadn't about. put that together. That's why he's wearing the wig. So he, yeah. is he still hiding out from like the Mr. Wu or the guy who get? Because we, we, we've gotten the hint that uh, he might be the yours truly uh, mentioned before working with uh, poor Tony where like they end up getting the heroin hot oh. shot and they end up having to ditch the guy in the dumpster. I do, mm. I, somebody told me that that was Lens. And it's that certain, might be Lens. So it I, lines up a little bit. It, it does. It, it might be, it might, that might be Lens. Okay. As I remember it, I can't remember if, that, if he's yours truly, but there is something about like, Recently, he somehow acquired just a lot of cocaine, like that he was supposed to deal or sell. And because he didn't show up, he didn't get caught in a sting of some kind. Like, so he just like made off with a ton of, and so he's hiding from, maybe it's Mr. Wu, he's hiding from somebody who he has a big mass of their drugs. That's, that's what I remember right now. Um, And and that's, I think that's what he's been, he's been sort of living off of, right? Like whatever, using off of while he's been hiding out in the halfway house. Um, but it, you know what, his specific, his specific situation of intake, I can't remember. It occurred before the novel really picked up because he's been in there since July, I think it's mentioned in here, right? Like he's been in there since the summer. So uh-huh. we didn't see his intake. Um, uh-huh. But I, I, it could be that he is, you know, the yours truly with you, okay. with Roar 20. Yeah, yeah, uh, could be. I, I, But it, it's so that. hard to know. Anything about Lentz is really hard to know because right. he's so unreliable. Mm-hmm. Like he, everything he reports is sort of, you go like, I don't know if this is real or not because of all the misspellings. It's like constantly reminding you like, this is not accurate. His perspective on what's going on is not all correct. Right. Well, we find out a lot of his thoughts towards the end of uh, our chunk here, but let's just get to it real quick. Yes. So, despite having a car, he always catches a ride with somebody else to meetings, being sure to bring a compass and sit in the northernmost seat. <laughs> and <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's good. Uh, but <sighs> always walks home. Now the walk takes twice as long as it should, which makes everybody suspicious, but he's been piss tested a bunch of times mm-hmm. and it's come back clean. So though the curfew break is typically punished, they allow Lens to do it. He wanders around in an absurd powdered white wig, which as you mm-hmm. just mentioned is a bit of a you know, uh, disguise. <laughs> uh, he has taken up the habit of stomping rats to death on his walk home 
hence the delay. He has later moved on to suffocating cats with trash bags, watching with interest the shape of the bag as the cat struggled, and eventually getting thicker trash bags <laughs> to get bigger prey that they can't break through. Yeah. 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 He, he is working out his, his feelings of powerlessness. Right. Yes. Is, what, is the way he describes it. And, and so he, he read about like a description of this in this giant William James on psychology and natural religions. Is that the title of it? Something like um, that. Which, you know, right. So he has, he found this giant book in the halfway house and he uses it to justify, he's like, Oh, there's something in there about catharsis. Um, it's, a, it's in a footnote. I can't remember 224 maybe um, that we, we learned that that's the book that he's using. Mm -hmm. But then we also find out that he has carved out with a razor blade about 300 pages of the book. And is right. just keeping his dash in there, mm -hmm. which again, I think just serves to like this like sort of weird relationship with psychology that Dave Foster Wallace has a sort of antagonistic relationship where he was like, literally Lentz is hiding his, hiding his compulsions in a book of psychology, uh -huh. right? Like the, the metaphor is just like right on the nose of like all of these ways to justify bad behavior. Look, I have it right here and uh -huh. you know, my drugs. So yeah. Yeah. It's really yeah, it's picturesque wild. little thing there. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, the, the main part of his catharsis is not only the killing of animals, but after the act is done, taking a good look at them and taking a deep breath and saying, there. there. Which yeah. I kind of get. I almost get that. It's like the, you, you know what I would actually compare it to? You ever have like a big meal and yeah. then you have one bite left and you <laughs> accidentally drop it on the floor or somebody takes it and mm -hmm. there's just a feeling of completion that's just taken away from you. Yeah. Right. So there is this like, he, he needs to, it's like, cause it is so much about like, I did this. Yes. Right. Like that's why he has to say there, like I did that. Mm -hmm. I put that in place. Right. Like I made that thing happen. Right. It's and literally that is what putting a period at the end of the sentence. Like it is done. Hmm. Yes, exactly. It is that sort of, it is that sort of compulsion. And it's, it's really interesting how it's described as ratcheting up an in intensity, right? Like oh, it starts yeah. off with rats Mm -hmm. And then he starts saying, like, ah, oh, that was sort of, uh, it, was, it was uninteresting, right? Mm -hmm. And so he starts off trying to poison cats. Yeah, it's not really, like, and then he tries, tries lighting them on fire. That's not always great because they chase me. And then he's like, no, the thing to do is, like, put them in this bag and watch. But right. then that gets uninteresting. And what he discovers is that, like, he really enjoys, because it gives him the active role in it, is the, uh, like, hitting of the cat against a sign or something right there. Right. It, it, and so it has, you see this gradual ratcheting up that's just like a very it's a very addict sort of sequence right like oh this was this exactly this was like chasing, oh, this, oh. chasing whatever is gonna whatever's making him feel better as it gets you know higher and higher we have here he ups his game from killing strays to killing the pets on their property for the extra thrill yes. this turned against him when he set a cat on fire which again i say this as a great <laughs> cinematic moment only for the burning cat to chase him over several fences screeching and then alerting neighbors to call the police uh Oh, we have it. He, he starts uh, moving on to killing dogs, slitting their throat, mm. always from behind so he doesn't get the spray. Um, yeah. And, and, his, and the and, thing and, he uses to lure them is exactly. a bit of Gately's meatloaf. <laughs> Poor Gately. I know. It's so, it, but it, it's really lovely that de that detail got closed up about like the terrible meatloaf that Gailey would like. It's just like a, I don't know, like it, it's just a, it's one of those perfect, like, oh, I remember the meatloaf, right? Like mm -hmm. those perfect callbacks that are really delightful. I, I just thought somebody's enjoying the meatloaf, even if it's not <laughs> to their ultimate uh, benefit. True. Uh, it is not to their ultimate benefit, but yeah. Oh, so man. So Lenz takes a small sabbatical now that Bruce Green has begun walking home with him. And Lenz is missing the release but can't get Green to leave him alone. Uh, yeah. There's also a weird thing. He's concerned because he also doesn't really mind the company. And Green has a type of silent, good listener aspect to him that's respectable, not the type to rat. He considers that Green maybe wouldn't even think twice about him killing for satisfaction. Uh, they said Lenz is tempted to try to end it, but the end it there, the, the strays around end it always garner some attachment from a female patient and obviously killing Pat M's dogs would be clear suicide. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I actually don't know if he thinks about telling Bruce about uh, killing animals, but I think he thinks he, what frustrates him is that he's like, I could just tell Bruce to go away and he wouldn't care. Right. And that's what gets him in this, like, oh, but I care. And I don't want, like, so, like, Lenz is, like, telling himself this whole narrative of, like, he can't say, leave me alone, because he's afraid, A, that it would offend Bruce, or that it wouldn't offend Bruce. 
Right. Like that to him is just as horrifying a thought for some reason, which is. And, and we get into how there's a weird, there, there's a, there's a pseudo kind of homosexual attraction. here. It's a, it's a subtext because he's also like, we, even at the line here, he's really rag, uh, agonizing on the ramifications. If he were to spurn green, noting that he'd feel nothing if it was some girl he was trying to X. So just like, yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. So I, I think it's pretty, pretty above text. Like he, <laughs> like he, he, he is sort of like talking about women is like, I, you know, it'd be very easy to lie to them, but I can't lie to this, this guy who really gets me. Like, like, I don't know. It's, I think it's pretty clear that it's like a more than just, or I don't know, like there, there's this thing motivating him about how he feels with Bruce that is very hard for him to like deal with. And he, and he doesn't have a script. Whereas if it's right. with a woman, he has a script of how to like lie and behave. But with this guy, he doesn't, he doesn't know. Right. So it's, yeah. You know, just to take that off in a different direction, I will actually say, there is a weird thing, particularly as you get older, I find it's mm. harder to make friends because as opposed to romance where it's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a girl and I'm trying to have sex with a girl and then I'm trying to fall in love and X, Y, Z. Whereas like actually trying to befriend somebody, it doesn't have a natural script. Yes. It's much and, more intimate. I yeah. think, oh, because yeah, of that. Right, because it's very like free form. You don't know, you don't really have a goal in mind. It's just, you're trying to, you're trying to glom something off of just your feelings for a person. Yeah. What they want is unclear. What you want is unclear, right? Mm. Like in our, in our normal relationships with people that, you know, it's clearly, clearly identified like, oh, I'm here to get with you. We know, everyone knows their game. They know what they're out for. Right. So it's, yeah, as you said, you know, I, I have the same problem. I, I, don't have, I don't have friends. I have people I do podcasts with. Like they're my friends, yeah. but like the way that, justify hanging out with them is that I have a podcast, right? Like, mm -hmm. this is odd. Like, why can't I just hang out with them? Why do I have to always bring my microphones? I don't know. Right. It's like the way I justify a connection. Yeah, but this also leads to a lot of different, like I have been actively, like in the comedy scene, for whatever reason, I really only have like one or two close friends, but I've been trying to change that lately because like there's other people where it's like, I, I like them, I like what they do, which is I only really see them at mics and shows. So let me actually try to hang out with them. And sometimes you get the frustrating thing where I actually make the connection again to romantic stuff. Like I have a friend of mine, uh, fuck it, I'll say his name, Seamus. Like I've tried okay. to hang out with Seamus a lot and like we seem to have a good time when we hang out, but I always have to be the one to contact Seamus. And I feel if <laughs> Seamus really wanted me in his life, he could reach out to me every he now and Contact again. me. <laughs> Just put the effort, pretend like you care, Seamus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel so ignored. Seamus, meanwhile, has no idea that this is going on. Seamus is like, that was so fun. Like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to see him again, right? Like, you know, it's like- but The, the, the is... also funny thing is knowing that he's a guy who has issues with anxiety as well. <laughs> Literally, we might be having the same conversation in our head. He might be like, why hasn't he called lately? I don't know. <laughs> Seamus is like, I don't know, should I reach out to him? He's really busy. I know he's got like all these things that he's doing. I don't know, you know, like- and this is, this is the absurd, this is, I think a lot of what the book is about is this level of anxiety of like, mm -hmm. I'm trapped in thinking of my narrative of what's going on. Right. And therefore it changes the way I behave. I think you see this a lot in Oren, most of all, right? Like Oren being like, my parents don't love me. They don't care. Da, da. But like, like, he's like, when he's there, he's like overbearing with his like apparent you know, jovial good nature, right? Like you see these things going on with Oren. Anyway, so like, I don't know. I think, I think David Foster Wallace very much also had a similar sort of anxiety I don't know, madness that made him sort of lonely, but mm. yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah. It's, it, it's really, it's really hard living in the world, which I think is yeah. also, you know, like, do you remember in the list of, uh, in Condenza's filmography, the, the, uh, I think about it all the time. The, the, one of the, sto one of the stories, I think it was maybe cage three, or maybe it was called something else. Uh, a carnival tent where on one side, the figure of death invites people in to watch terrible torments that are so enjoyable. They become eyeballs. And on the other side, the figure of life invites them in to experience such terrible torments, the reward for which is watching a bunch of people become eyeballs. <laughs> like the, the thing that seems, to be, that seems to be at the core of a lot of what's going on in the novel is you can choose to really see what's happening in life. You can choose to just be like, okay, I'm going to be honest. And it's painful and difficult. And the reward is just that you see it clearly. Right? right, like that's what life, that's what so much of life is about, right? You just tell Seamus, like Seamus, 
I want you to reach out to me sometimes, which, you know, is such a, such an embarrassing thing to reveal. Right. Oh, and yeah. maybe the, the reward is just like that. You know, that was Seamus, right? Like there's, there's not like a incredible result at the end mm. and you could just ignore that and go on your normal life. And you, you somehow don't really witness the truth, right? Like that's the thing you lose. Like life is really hard and the reward is kind of small, I guess is right. something I think about a yeah, lot. Yeah, like you could be the most motivated person in the world, but it's like at, at best, like maybe you'll understand the place a little better or have a little bit of freedom to move around. It's still gonna end the same way. You're, yeah. People you love are going to die. They're going to betray you. Good, good job reading. Let's see if it fucking... <laughs> Didn't help you much. I'm glad you put your time to it. All that liberal arts education and you're still dead, right? Like, the, like Life is a liberal arts education. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it, I, I, I really think there's a lot to that in this book, which is just like, there's, I think part of the reason it's so long is that mm. I feel David Foster Wallace frantically working out like why it's all worth suffering through, mm. right? Like, like constantly different options of like, different people who are you know choosing not to suffer and why that's bad or choosing to suffer and why that's like maybe good mm -hmm. like it's just this constant rehashing of like why is this worth going through and then its length becomes another thing like all right if i go through this very painful thing i'll get to the end and i won't be all that enlightened but i will have witnessed something like it you know like there, there's a way that it sort of becomes a metaphor for that as well right so. yeah, there's, a, there's a notion of earning it but uh I don't know. But anyway, so what we have here is, uh, so Lenz yeah. realizes that his five lines of self-medication, yeah, he sneaks away from Green to, to you know, medicate himself, but he does in, it a bit In the much. AA meeting, in the what? AA meeting, he, he sneaks away, he thinks no one noticed anything, but he's like, he's like got two cigarettes in his mouth and one in the ashtray. Mm. Like, he's like so obviously, <laughs> and his mouth is twitching, but he's like, yeah. he thinks I was so cool. <laughs> and... Uh -huh. Then oh. the verbal tirade starts. Yes. But before that, we actually get a brief note on hydrolysis, which is oh, the method yes. of absorption for cocaine and how it makes cocaine unpleasant for some people, which is where we get... Uh, the word of the week, yes. Yes, this is where we get the word of the week. We also get that for Gately, cocaine causes the sensation of spiders on the back of his hand, making him hate coke and cokeheads alike. It gives Green a walloping depression before it even wears off and sends him into weeping fits. <laughs> Mm, poor green I, there's a, there's a, there's a lot more i didn't write it all down we got but it, much, you know, it's a good it's a good footnote like it oh, really yeah. what it's interesting it comes at a moment that sort of runs down quickly all the characters of ennett house mm -hmm. or of yeah of yeah sorry of ennett house yes ennett, and like yeah. and it because it just quickly tells you like it reminds you of sort of what's at stake because i think the other thing and i'm very excited for you going forward both you jesse oh. and the listeners of like what it's building to like uh -huh. there's a reason I think as a, as a person who likes plots, there's a reason that that footnote is there to quickly okay. remind you, like, these are all the people, like, remember them, care about them. And these are the right. details about them. So, okay. yeah. Well, I, I didn't know it's, it's reminding, it's reminding the shared background of all these people, but I think it's also kind of showing like, also it should be noted that like lens is the only one who's really into this. And that probably says a thing or two about lens. It does. You're right. That's a really good point. Like it's, totally goes like Lenz is very different from all these other yes, people like yes. he wants to be he is wired like this uh -huh. yeah so Ugh, yeah he is now too high and very glad to have green by his side or anybody really to hear all his coke thoughts out loud like he has a fear of clocks and watches due to his stepfather making Lenz wind his watch every morning and would be beaten with a rolled up newspaper if the clock was off that his mother was the track and flange yes <laughs> that his mother was obese and had a laugh like being eaten alive. Uh, the plots mm. of several novels he has read. That he once had the tip, yeah. <laughs> the, that he once had the tip of his finger cut off by a bike chain, but grew it back like a lizard's tail through sheer concentration. And that is the moment you go like, oh wait a minute, like how much of this is real or not right because that is something uh, that like it's all comical right like the things about the the father this so portly that his stomach comes in like several minutes like, several right. seconds ahead of him like these things are like okay like maybe that's real maybe it's not but what the detail is like what like he grew back a finger like you start to go like okay i don't know how much of this is real but what's really complicated is then other things he starts saying are things that we have heard about or think might be true about like the great concavity like right. there are there are these moments where you're like, wait, if I don't know that I can trust Lentz, but he's saying things that I think are true. 
because I think you're supposed to start doubting all of that, or at least starting to think that there's more going on. Right. Or, or that Lentz just magically knows all this. I don't, I don't know exactly what to take from it, except that it makes you rethink how seriously can I take everything I know about the Great Concavity? Because if Lentz thinks it's all true, should I think it's all true? Because Lentz thinks he grew back his finger. You know, like it's... Right. Well, he also gets into like a, a lot of cults and like uh, uh, there was a real estate cult. A, yeah. a real estate cult and a cult of Delawareans who worshipped virtual reality pornography, though it made them bleed from the eyes. <laughs> um, we find yeah. out there's apparently a cult of former Rastafarians who now worship the giant infant in the <laughs> concavity, convexity. Yeah. And how uh, he feels for them because it's, every, oh, every it's year... It's what? It... No, go ahead. <laughs> No, it's just, it's just wild because he's, no, as you're saying, like, he's describing, like, we know, or at least it's been said previously by somebody, an unknown narrator, that there are giant babies crawling across the Great Concavity. Right. But we, now Lentz is saying it, which makes me go, like, I don't know if this is real or if he's making this up about these Rastafarians because he's, like, a, he's a racist little, terrible little person who kills dogs. You know, like, like I, I don't know how well to take his word, mm-hmm. which I think is a really interesting way that it, like, complicates our knowledge of those things, but you, you were going on with like the craziness of the Rastafarian uh, oh, yeah. the conspiracy. I don't even know what the call. But, like but like apparently every year they wander, they wander into the wilderness, which lends notes like he would hate having no idea what the date or the direction was, and a lot of them end up freezing to death before they come back. Yeah. Um, he it's, also he also throws in a detail that he killed a jeweler with Aikido skills, which I guess nobody has ever been killed with Aikido, ever, ever, ever. It's there's just no way it's all true. Like, mm-hmm. and you know, the other thing that I, as we're reading it, we're like trying to make sense. Like, how much of this is true or not? But it's always funny for me to zoom out and be like, Bruce Green is just walking next to him. <laughs> yeah, just like yeah. <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Yeah, you really you really killed that guy with the keto. I mean, like, I don't know how Bruce Green can just take all of that. Or at least it's interesting. I, I, I love how he sums it up at the end where he says the line we've heard a few times. is like, yeah, cults with the brainwashing, you know? <laughs> they, some a, people say AA is brainwashing, but I figure my brain could probably use a wash. Like, I love people mindlessly repeating that that piece of good advice, honestly. Yeah. But, <laughs> It, it's cliche because it's true. Like that comes up in the book several times. Is that like, uh, like it, would it be helpful for Bruce to break all of that down? I don't know. Like, I think he says the thing that's helpful, which is like, well, maybe I needed to like calm down. Right. Like yeah. it's, it's really interesting. And it's really interesting. I mean, it's one of those moments that makes me start to really like Bruce green as well. Mm-hmm. Like it's not that I didn't like him up to this point, but I'm just like, wow, how is he putting up with this? Like, right. How is he just, yeah, you, my brain needed a wash, right? Uh, like, it's nuts. You know, there, there, there might be something good. This is a side note I had. I was curious whether to even get into it because it's not really to do with the book. It's more to do with the presentation. Mm. But I think we've hit on a little bit where we have uh, Lens kind of like exaggerating his entire drug background where Bruce just seems kind of like, yeah, I'm addicted to drugs. I'm just dealing with it. And Gately, we've heard the actual bad things Mm-hmm. So there is a thing in media where I feel I feel like this comes a lot from rock stars having notorious drug problems where uh-huh. their drug addicts are always pre- portrayed as being like super creatives and having like whimsical, crazy lives. Like we hear with Lens where he talks about like, oh, the woman came in, she had dead seagulls on a necklace and her child had no skull. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's crazy. Oh, dream yeah yeah but that's always bothered me because i feel like I, I i've known a lot of drug addicts like they play video games and listen to eminem and they pass out or like you know they fucking finger their girlfriend's sister and that's that's it that's about as bad as it gets but there's always like these big epi- it, it, i don't know it's it's a mix of again you don't know what's true and what's not uh i i think that uh that controversy with the guy of a million little pieces with the oprah thing is a perfect example where like he exaggerated and made up a bunch of his drug stories, which, you know, everybody mm-hmm. rightly went like, oh, well, shame on you for lying. But then on the other hand, why is the public so voracious to take in and want to believe this false narrative? Yeah, which is, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to put it that way because they, yeah, they seem to want that exaggeration, like the public. Mm-hmm. And it happened with this book as well. Mm-hmm. Because people immediately, when it was published and quite popular, people were like, oh, David Foster Wallace, he spent time in rehab and like, he's got great, you know, like, and they were doing the same thing to him, which was, which is really funny. Cause I do think the book does a great job of showing like, you know, all of these 
people from different walks of life are addicted to things, right? Like, you know, like there, there is just the very generic Hal smokes too much weed. And then there is that Gailey was addicted to a thing that would just make him fall asleep, right? Like mm-hmm. essentially, like just like de- depressants, right? Like, or, or painkillers. Anyway, so it, I, I think the book really shows like the full, the full way that like, sometimes they're not very interesting lives, right? Like Bruce Green just like sort of got abandoned and therefore yeah. has a pro like, you know, Mildred just ran off and he's like, I don't know what to do now, right? And then there is Lentz, who is somebody who is like a larger than life character who is wandering the night in an Andy Warhol getup, killing yeah. dogs. Like, I mean, like, the, like you, you get the whole extreme, I think, in this book, but it is interesting that people want to believe that it's all very extreme or that it's all, you know, super eclectic and interesting. I don't know why that is. I think we have a fascination with the artist as a madman. Yeah. Like the artist has to be mad. Well, I feel like the artist has that as well, because I mean, because it's not only, I would think of somebody like Hunter S. Thompson, who, when you actually Mm -hmm. look into him, like lived a boring, like pretty sad life that just like needed drugs to cope with existence. And the moment yeah. it didn't help his existence anymore, he blew his fucking brains out with his son in the house in the next room. But like, yeah, like he was, he very much wanted to present himself as like the madman and the public clearly ate it up enough that we have like, you know, two, fe- two feature films of him being portrayed as a madman. I mean, yeah, it's, it's troubling. Cause I, I mean, I do think there's something to be said that making art, I think making comedy like requires a different perspective on things everyone else just accepts as real, right? Like just like, right. you know, like, you know, making comedy about how people like go to work doing something they hate so they can go home to, you know, like, like there's this way that people just accept like, oh, I just have to go. I got to like work in the pipe factory or whatever, and then go mm-hmm. home and like, watch something on the television and fall asleep and get up and go and do that again and finding the way to make it funny that like so what you just like sacrificed your whole life for pipes requires seeing past what everyone else just takes as normal which takes right. a strain of madness maybe or it takes a willingness to be different or strange you know what? i think i'm more okay with the idea of the madness because like we always say it's, it's something that makes somebody special you'd have to be you'd yeah. have to be mad to you know leave your leave your homeland and go to you know the the new frontier in america back in the day yeah but i feel it's almost like the modern conduit is and also you get there through drugs it because i it, see it, yeah it, it's not enough to just be like the weird guy it has to be like oh well they, they i mean you even see this in uh if we're talking about media that like young people are taking in right now and i'm not trying to say this as like a hoity-toity you know down there <laughs> but like the mumble rap guy <laughs> you and, you young <laughs> You young bucks, yeah. Mumble but, rap? Oh yeah, but, <laughs> oh, that's but, too young for me, apparently. Uh, well, no, the mumble rap guy, like they're all on fucking, you know, uh, codeine and cough syrup and shit like that. And they're the, like, there's a guy named uh, Lil Pump that I'm actually fascinated with because, like, he says in his songs repeatedly, "I'm a millionaire and I don't know how to read," and like, <laughs> people love this fucking guy. Absurd. Yeah. I don't. I do, uh, Yeah. I don't know why we think it has to be through drugs rather than just like, oh, a creative person. But we do have this strain where we, you know, ah, I, we want it to be chemical. I don't know what it is. I, th- I think it. I have a theory. I think I have a theory on why am I- Ooh, let's hear it. I think it might be if the way to become that madman that everyone can't take their eyes off of is drugs, there might be a notion to the audience itself is that could be me if I was brave enough. If I was willing to risk it and, you know, risk losing my job and just like try this shit out and expand my mind and, you know, do all this, maybe I would be the one on adventures that people can't take their eyes off of. Yeah, maybe. And like, so like it makes possible all of the approval and attention that they're getting, right? Like it makes it like, I could get that if I wanted. That's interesting. I, I don't know. I, I have always found a different sense of like what America's relationship with drugs are is like it, it, our relationship with drugs seems very much to do with like, it's like a way that people get the approval or the feeling that they can't get from the rest of their life. Right. Like, and uh-huh. that's why they like, they go to that because like they, you know, we like a lot of people my age smoke, smoke weed because like they're so stressed all the time. Yeah. Right. They have no other way that they can relax. Like because of how high strung we are as a people or, 
you know, if we're not having any fun, these are people that want cookie. Like I've always felt that it, like we have a sort of medical approach to it. We're like, well, I'm unhappy. I will fix it with a, with a this, right? And therefore right. I have it. Um, but it is interesting to think that like, it's also that we are chasing a myth that we've been told like, this is how I could have a great time. This and it's, could be really it's, fun. And it's told to us through media a lot. I mean, part yeah. of the thing I will answer back to people is like, oh, well, I'm not happy. Like, well, who told you you should be happy every mm. moment of the day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Who said that life is all about happiness, mm -hmm. right? Which comes up a lot, I think, in the Steeply Morath conversation a lot, where they're like, is the point just to be happy? Like, is that the goal of it? And like, uh, Steeply is like, well, you know, it's the, the reasonable employment and freedom from, you know, like, that, that's the point. And right. Morath is just like, I don't know. Why is that the goal? Right. When you consider like, you know, like consider like all the work that went into developing penicillin, like was anybody waking up going, this will make me happy today to, to, to put one tiny brick of a hundred years of research into this, mm. you know? Yeah. I, yeah. Is it making them happy or like, or, and if, if they, could they be unhappy and still be doing that work or how could they make themselves happy when you're unhappy? That's not about drugs. And that's so much of what the book is about, right? Like that's infinite. That's the reason I think it's still relevant is it's mm. constantly circling this question of like, how, could you, you know, be attending this like really rigorous tennis academy and not be a, a worn out husk? How right. could you be trying to go into the, a professional sphere and not be constantly drowning in anxiety about how good you are at it, right? Mm. How can we hold ourselves somehow sane in a world that is just like uh, kind of insane? Yeah. I don't know. A lot of stuff to think of. Buddy, those are my notes for this week. This was, uh, this was a good That's one. That's great. Man. That was, it's really good. And again, there, you, there is so much, not to be a little bit too, you know, the best is yet to come, but like there is stuff coming that it is very exciting. Like I am so excited to hear how you react to the coming weeks in, in the yeah. podcast. Cause it's, it gets, it gets crazy. I, one of the things I think, um, I think about a lot as a storyteller is like right now, you notice how much jumping around there was in this section. Yeah. Like yeah. how much editing there is like, of like oh, and this and then this, and then we're here and then we're here and then we're here. That's because it's like building up in pace. Okay. To something. Well, see, it's funny because I know that I, I've noticed it's building up in pace, yet at the same time, somebody sent me something on the uh, Sherbinsky gasket or something like that, and how this is built, uh, the structure of the novel is built around that. But one of the things they note is how the actual chapter, obviously you and I are not doing actual chapters because they right. fluctuate a lot, Yeah. but how the actual chapters of the book get exponentially like bigger as mm. they go. So it seems like while the it, it, things are getting cut around a lot, while the themes are getting bigger and like the scope of the novel is kind of, I, I, I'm definitely getting the feeling of all the pawns being set up on the board right now. Yes. I, I, I would say like that we're you're going to start to, we're going to start to see him play. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think at this point, this is where to me, the novel really starts to sing. So I, okay. I, I, th this is, and you have to get through a lot to get there, which is hilarious. Like I often, I have, I have given this book to so many people. The book sort of mm -hmm. haunts me because I'll, I'll show up in a new place and people are like, oh, I have a meaning to read that. And I'm like, okay, I'll arrange it. And like, before <laughs> I know it, like, and I, and everyone always drops off. Like I, it's happened twice that I'm like, okay, let's read it. And then like, by the time I'm at like this point, everyone else is like, ah, I couldn't, I stopped at 200 or 400 or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. and, but if, if people made it to here, <laughs> the rest was was delightful so yeah okay. well i i look <laughs> forward to that i mean i'm over the hump now i'm stuck in i keep saying i think it would be hilarious if i just never did a final episode and just stopped but you just quit now <laughs> that would be that would be that would be too cruel even for me maybe i'll skip that week just to be a dickhead but <laughs> <laughs> leave them on their own the you know you go out for smokes and never come back exactly. anyway <laughs> <laughs> i'll be right back kids i'm gonna go get some eggs all right, well, Paul. Yeah, or whatever. So oh, much God. for doing this, man. This was a blast. Jesse, uh, it was really wonderful. Yeah, yeah really cool. I, again, I, I, when I saw you were doing this, I, I, I just emailed you because I was like, this is exactly what I want to do with this book. <laughs> like, you are doing exactly what I thought I wanted to do. So it's, you're doing great work, and it's, I, I hope it's really, I think it's really helpful for people as they go to read through it, to have some community. So cool hey, that's, stuff. What, that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping it's people who not only like the book, but people like me who, like, want to, they, they need their hand held through it a little bit. Yeah. So, hopefully. yeah. so tell yeah. us again, uh, your podcast, where we can find you on social media, anything you got going on. 
yeah, so uh, the podcast is called The Offer, Original Stories Podcast. We have a website called theoffercast.com, which you can check out, and that'll link to our socials and stuff. We're on, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I'm learning how to post on those. Um, that's mostly what I have going on right now. I've just moved back to the States. I was, uh, I was living in Shanghai, and I was teaching theater out there, so I've moved back, and I'm going to be teaching improv here with a group called The Unscripted Project. We're going into Philly schools, which is really cool, and I'm excited to get started with that. But other than that, it's just like various audio production stuff. I'm recording various educational poems and stuff. anyway, but uh, the improv podcast is the thing that I've, I've leaned into. Uh, so it's okay. a long form, it's long form and it's right. lots of fun. I do make it with my friend Caesar and it's really cool. So yeah, the offercast.com, you can find all the episodes there. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, Paul Dykeman. Uh, I'm going to end you, this episode the way I always do. I'm going to stop recording, but you and I can sit <laughs> for a little bit longer. Have a nice week, everyone. <laughs>